Oftentimes, the question is asked, what happens to those who haven't heard the gospel? This is often asked as a loophole, in my opinion, that people try to find in the gospel to allow people who haven't heard the gospel to get into heaven. Because if you haven't heard, you haven't had the option to make a choice. Uh, second of all, it's often used as an excuse not to preach the gospel. If you haven't heard again, then you, God will give you some kind of uh, exception to get into heaven. So maybe I shouldn't preach it because the less it here, the more chance that they'll have to, to get into heaven because it couldn't make a choice. But this is usually made in context of people who live in faraway lands and third world countries or isolated locations that that apparently you know we can't get to or haven't got to as missionaries to preach them the gospel. But I think one thing people forget is that the gospel started in like the Middle East, you know, Jerusalem, those kind of areas, and it spread out from there into the Africa, the, the Far East, and other Middle Eastern locations. So as far as it gets to the West, you know, we're kind of late to the game as far as it getting out here. So if it got to us, why wouldn't it get to anywhere else? But one thing that I will say is I don't accept that premise that there are people who haven't heard or, or they won't have a present. They won't have an opportunity to respond to God and, and, and hear about Jesus Christ. And part of that is because of what the scripture says in Romans chapter one, verses 18 through 21, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what they because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. What I see there is, verse 18 says, they suppress the truth. That means they, they know the truth, they just push it down and ignore it. Verse 19 talks about that it's manifest in them, which means God's, God is plain to them. So they, they see him clearly, they just, they just ignore him. And then it says, it also says that um, God has shown them. So they've already had a presentation from God, so to speak, from them. And it says that in verse 20, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. That means God is available. He's, he's open. There's no, no excuse for not seeing that he's, he is real in this world. And verse 20 also says they're without excuse. So when they go before God, they're not going to be able to say, well, you know, we didn't know you existed. And, and then in verse 21, it says they knew God. So they knew he existed. Now, yes, that doesn't mean they knew the gospel, but if God's trying to get it to them and they, they, and they acknowledge that he's there, then that is a, is a next logical step, is that they will hear the gospel from that. It's people don't even want to know, know God in general because they suppress him. So why would they go as far as hearing the gospel message? They don't even acknowledge his presence or his existence. And then we go again, we just flip over to Romans chapter 2, verse 15. And in Romans 2, 2 chapter, in Romans 2, verse 15, it says, Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and, be and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. What I see here is that the law is written on their hearts. So people know right and wrong, which comes from God, basically, because he's put it in their hearts. You don't really have to tell people, you know, if they see something sinful, if somebody's getting beat up, getting murdered, kids getting hurt, something like that. People instinctively know that's wrong. And so that comes from God. That's another example of him being there, of being being real. It says their conscience is bearing witness and their thoughts are accusing or defending them. So we have a conscience and that comes from God. Again, we know when we do something wrong and we feel guilt or or when we're, we're wronged by somebody else and we're hurt. That is an acknowledgement of, of something from God, that he's given us this innate understanding of what is right and wrong and how to treat each other. And then if we go over to flip the chapter again or flip the book again over to Romans 3, chapter 19, excuse me, Romans 3, verse 19, it says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. 
right there in verse 19, it says, all the world may become guilty. That's everybody. The world is everybody. There is nobody that's forgotten. There's no caveat saying all the world except those who live in some isolated location that, that we haven't got to or, or who doesn't have the internet connection so they can hear a message on the, on the web or something like that. It says all the world may be guilty before God because, of, because they have clearly seen him, but they've suppressed the truth. Because he's put the, his con they've given us conscious, a consciousness where we would know right and wrong, we already know he exists. And that's why we're guilty, because we didn't want to know him. And because we didn't want to know him, we didn't receive the gospel. And one of my favorite verses is in Acts chapter 17. And if we go to verses 26 and 27, it says, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So right there, it says from one blood, he's made every nation of men. We all are descendants of Adam and Eve. Adam and, Eve. and that leads to the fact that he is not far from us because he knows where we are in this time and space. And he hasn't put himself far from us. And that is consistent with what we read in Romans. He's not far from us because his attributes are clearly seen. We just, we just ignore it because he's given us the conscience and, and things of that nature that we're all guilty before him. We know he exists. We just don't want to know him. We don't want to acknowledge him because we want to be our own gods. And because we want to be our own gods, we don't recognize that we're sinners and that we're spiritually dead and that we need the life of God and the forgiveness that, that God gave us through dying on the cross. We don't even get that far because we don't acknowledge his existence. If there's somebody in the world that we say we don't want to acknowledge that they're alive, how are we going to get to know them? And if we don't get to know them, how are we going to see what they have to offer us? We won't. And that ultimately is our fault. And then one of the most famous verses is Matthew 16, verse 18. And there Jesus says, and I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Oftentimes the focus of this verse is about Peter and the rock and trying to figure out all that. But I see that Jesus says, I will build my church. The church is the, it will be built by the Lord. He is actively out there in the world, actively responding to people who are seeking God, seeking him, trying to get things answered. He responds to them, even if we can. And that's what we have to remember. His church is building just fine. There is got, gonna be, there's not going to be anybody in heaven that doesn't want to be there. And there's not going to be anybody in hell that doesn't want to be there. God will get his message to them. He will show them that he exists and he will lead them to faith in Jesus Christ. And one of the ways I say this, although this is, you know, although, although this seems anecdotal, there was an example I heard of a guy named Joffrey who lived in Africa. Apparently Joffrey was a young man and his father went out into the wilderness and cut down a tree or cut some bark from a tree and made, a, made an idol and was praying to the idol and, and that, that idol was his God. Well, Joffrey, in his wisdom, he was like, well, my dad made that idol. Who made the tree? And that acknowledgement, that inquiry that he made was actually answered by God because not soon after that, Joffrey ran into a Christian ministry who presented the gospel to him and Joffrey became a Christian. And he went from Africa to the United States to witness to us. So there's the exact opposite. He went from, if you will, a, a third world country to a first world country to witness, witness to us because people here may not know about it. And then secondly, there was a, a testimony of a Muslim lady named, I think it was a, a Fruce. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but she was a frustrated Muslim. And she made a prayer to Allah, asking Allah to show himself to her and, and you know, answer whatever question she had. Well, she had a dream. And in the dream, Jesus showed up to her. Now she didn't know who that was, but Jesus showed up to her and relate to her Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where he talks about, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. She didn't know what that was. Well, she had a, a Christian coworker or, or friend that she told this dream to and the coworker pulled out the Bible and showed her the verse. And she was, she was convicted and became a Christian. So here's an example of Jesus doing the work. He showed up in her dream 
and that led to her going to find a Christian coworker and revealing himself, revealing himself to her that way. And she accepted the gospel. And now she's she's one of us, or she's a Christian. And then the third one is um, I heard a, a testimony from a missionary who said he was uh, doing work in a war torn third world country, and there was this poor young lady, poor young girl who had seen her mother die and through you know through the act of war. And the family was struggling and, and um, they didn't know about Jesus or anything of that nature. And the missionary came came to her and, and showed, showed a picture of Jesus. And I don't know what picture this was. I'm assuming it's the standard picture we show of Jesus. Um, but anyway, he showed this picture to this young lady and she said, that's the guy who was in my dreams. So Jesus had already been talking to her, preparing her. And then she runs into a missionary who reveals to, to him that well she's already seen this guy and it was jesus has already been talking to her and so he leads her to christ he connects the dots and, and now she's a christian so my whole point in saying all this is that are there really people who haven't heard well yeah they haven't heard but the bible's clear it's not going to be an excuse if they're truly seeking i think god will be patient and and kind enough to work a way to, to get the gospel to them but the people who don't hear about them is because they don't want to hear about them. They don't even want to acknowledge God to begin with, but most likely they don't want to hear about them at all. And, you know, just to assuage that belief, if there are people who somehow never hear about the gospel and they were truly trying to seek God and find out God for themselves, I trust God will make the right decision on that. You know what that'll be? I don't know. But he's a loving God. He's a just God. He'll make the right decision. I'm not saying they're going to go to heaven or not guaranteeing they're going to hell. He just, that's his decision to make. But to ask the question to begin with is kind of doesn't make sense because if Jesus, is, if God has done all this to put himself close to people so he's not far from them, then there's really no excuse why they don't turn to him. Most likely it's just because they don't want him, as the scripture says. So, you know, somebody says, what about those who haven't heard? You tell them, well, you've heard. What are you doing with the gospel? That's what it really comes down to. So I hope this helps you. Have a good day. Grace and peace.